Fred um, for months and months, and then only to come up on their due date and realize, oh, this child was never even pregnant. This is very hard to tell just by looking at them. Come here. Now, Blossom has been exposed to gold for a couple of months, so she ought to be bred. But there's really no guarantee until we do the pregnancy test or she has a calf. You can see, she's not a real big, fat cow. She's not real tiny and skinny. She's a good weight. So with her not being real big, the calf doesn't always show up right away. And even if they are real fat, then you really can't tell. So it's very difficult to tell just by looking at them. Now, you could have a vet come out and palpate your cow, where they kind of reach up in there and feel if there's a calf in there, or feel if their uterus is distended or something. But that's pretty expensive to have a vet come out and check. So this test only costs about $2.50 a piece, and it's pretty relatively painless. So to me, it's very well worth it. You can test a number of cows very quickly if you just get into a good routine of drawing blood real quick. And the cost for the lab we send it to is about $2.50 a sample. And then you have priority mail shipping, which is like $7.25. So altogether, it's totally worth it to get your cows pregnant. You can test them when they're 28 days bred. So 28 days after you think they were bred, then you can go ahead and pull a sample and test them. And it works later on, too, all the way up until birth. But uh, it's just a good way to know, especially if you don't own your own bull or if you have a larger herd and you maybe need to pull some cows, you don't want to be butchering pregnant cows. So it's a good way to just check and see if they are pregnant or not. And that way, you, especially if you have the Lisa bull, you can know whether he needs to come back or whatever. So it's a good secondary check too. Obviously, if the cow is coming in heat, she's not bred. But it's a good way to check and see. In case you're not confident of the signs of heat in cows, or in case you just want to be sure and have that peace of mind. It's a good way to check. When you draw blood, you'll need a few basic supplies. One thing that you'll need is a tube, because this is what you're going to send to the lab. And I'll mention this again later, but make sure you write the cow's name on this tube. There's a form that you fill out. You need to make sure that the name or tattoo number or whatever it is that you're using for identification has to match the name on the tube and the name on the form. So make sure to use the same for both or else you'll be very confused by the test results. Obviously, another thing you'll need is you have to have a way to get the blood. And so I'm going to use a syringe. You could use a vacutainer tube, but to me that's a bit harder. I just feel like I need a third hand whenever I do that. So I'm going to use a syringe and a needle. Now you're supposed to have two to three mLs or cc's of blood to be sampled. So using a 3 ml syringe is a little on the small side. And this is a 20 gauge needle. Now an 18 or 16 gauge needle is a bigger needle, and so it might actually work a little better. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and use 20 gauge because that's what I have. I'm going to use 6 ml because this has the 20 gauge needle, but it's a shorter needle. I've, this is a 1 inch long needle, 20 gauge, and the other one that I was going to use is 1 and a half. So it's a little easier to deal with the one inch. So that's what I'm going to use, 6 ml syringe with a one inch needle. I get these from Jeffers. They're pretty inexpensive. And you can use them for all kinds of things besides just drawing blood. Also, I will be using an alcohol prep pad. This is just the basic prep pad like what might be used at a vet's office or even at your doctor um, to just clean the area. <clears throat> you can use just regular rubbing alcohol or iodine on a cotton ball, just rub the site. Uh, but I have these and so I use them. So, as far as equipment over here, we have our stanchion and it needs a little bit of repair right now. We're missing one of the headlock boards. So I'm going to have to use a rope halter and lead rope. And I prefer to use a rope halter. I learned to use them with the horses and I think they get better control with the cows as well instead of a webbing halter. Sometimes a webbing halter is better. This time I'm going to try off with a rope and we'll see what happens. And then a lead rope. And I also have a second lead rope here to prevent her from going forward. So this one will keep her from going forward through the stanchion. This one I'm going to tie up here to keep her from going back out of it. Which I'll also have her locked in like this so that she can't um, back up or move sideways. And I also have a bucket of feet up here to hopefully keep her relatively happy. 
finishes her feed because that should make things a lot easier if she's busy with this. That rope should keep her from coming forward too much. This one I want to give her enough slack where she can still reach her food. Not so much that she can run away with me and the needle and the tube and everything. <laughs> okay. So, first you want to clean the site. When you clean this, you don't want to brush the matter back where you've already wiped. So. I mean, it doesn't have to be super ultra clean, but you want it to be reasonably clean. I'll get out my needle and syringe. You should always be extremely careful with a syringe because you don't want to end up stabbing yourself with a cow or anything um, unnecessarily. Now, when you draw the blood, you're going to be taking it from right about here, three to five inches from the base of the tail in this valley. I don't know how well it shows up on camera, but you can see there's ray skin on this side and ray skin on this side and a valley in between. And that's called the midline ridge and there's a vein in there somewhere. So I'm going to make sure that my needle is on tight. This is a lure lock needle which is my favorite because it doesn't blow off as quickly. So I'm going to tighten that on to make sure that it's tight and then pull off that cap. Okay. Now the idea is to stick it perpendicularly into the cow's tail and hopefully you'll hit the vein. I'm gonna go in about half an inch. Take my blood. Oh dear. Oh, there it is. Oh boy. Oh big girl. Okay, so now I'll just pull that. Oh. Glossy. Whoa. This is where I tied her up. I have just about enough there, but I want to make sure because it is no fun to have to redraw. Okay, there we go. I'll just put my finger on that for just a second to keep it from bleeding. And in a couple minutes, she'll forget all about it. Okay, so there I have just about three mLs of blood. going to put the blood into this tube. There's a vacuum in this tube that should draw the blood in, but you want to get the blood in the tube uh -oh, as quickly as possible after drawing it, because otherwise you end up with the problem I have, which is that it begins to get coagulated. So, I am probably going down to pull another sample because it appears that this blood has already clotted up and I cannot get it into the tube. So this is something to be aware of when you're pulling blood is go ahead and get it right into the tube if you don't use a back container. So I'm going to go ahead and put Blossom back in here, try to get another sample. And this time I'm going to stick it straight in the tube instead of waiting to talk about it. A second spot that you can draw blood is from the jugular vein. This is a little more dangerous actually, because especially if you have a cow with horns, because you're more likely to get hit with the horn. But I seem to not be having any success with tail bleeding right now, so I'm going to do this.
there are kind of, it lies in a valley here between the windpipe and esophagus and all this down here, and muscle mass and bone up here. So there's kind of a valley, and the jugular lies right in that valley. Now I've cleaned it up with a prep pad, and now I'm just going to press on that jugular vein with my thumb to engorge it. Now I don't know if it shows up, but there's an engorged vein here now, and I'm going to just stick that. Going to, you know what? Before I stick that, I need to be sensible and tie her head up tighter. So, hang on just a second. Get her head tied up a little tighter, so at least she can't reach me if she gets upset. There are definitely better ways to do it than this, but this is what we've got today. Okay, enough blood. Give me that tube. Now this time, better go straight in. There we go. Ah, feels good to get that done. All right, so now I'll just label it with her name right here. And first, let me put this on so I don't stab myself. Okay, so I'll label this with her name. She's the only cow I'm drawing from today, so I'm not going get, to get it mixed up. But standard procedure should be pull the sample, immediately label the tube. Or better yet, label the tube before you pull the sample. I'm just going to check. She's not bleeding. I cleaned it up, so she should be just fine. And now I'm going to put the four much stuck cow back into the pasture and go inside and fill out the work. Quick note here about the needles. These are the needles that I pulled off the syringes that I used. Now, you can't just, oh, and here is a third. You can't just throw these away in the regular trash can. They could hurt somebody. They're not biodegradable, or at least not readily biodegradable. So, you don't want to just throw these in the garbage. You need to put them in a special container, a special place, and label it, preferably sharps. And then when you have a good opportunity, um, especially if you can take them to some disposal facility, or some people I think will bury them in concrete, various things like that, um, you have to dispose of these very safely. Make sure they're not in anywhere where they can ever hurt somebody, because you don't want the different contaminated matter, you know, blood or antibiotics or whatever it is that you've been using a needle for, you don't want that getting into someone. So just a word about be careful of your sharps. All right, so I've come out here to package up the samples and I'll just show you my supplies. You will need a sample submission form, which is quite simple to fill out. You just put in your name, address, um, phone number and email address and write down how much you're paying. This I use I filled this section out the first time that I submitted samples and then realized that was only for them to use and so um, I had to redo it. But then you request how you want your report to be sent. I prefer to get mine emailed to me because that way I can show potential buyers um, 
the, the animals that they're interested in have a clear um, report from the lab. And then down here, you will fill this in with your animal's ID, in this case it's their name. Um, so you only want to put there what is actually written on the tube. So, tube says buttercup, write buttercup. You write how many days bred approximately, it doesn't have to be exact, as best you can guess. In this case I'm just going to say 30 because I don't know. And if you want a test added, you would note that there. Um, since this is specifically for pregnancy testing, you do not need to specify the pregnancy test. You only need to specify if you want a test added to it. Then you say what date the samples were drawn, what date they were sent, and the number of samples. So that's pretty simple. I also have the lab's address here, and of course our return address, and our three samples. And I happen to be blessed to have been given some biohazard bags but you don't have to have a biohazard bag. What you'll do is bundle these samples up with a rubber band, put them in a Ziploc bag, and if you don't have a biohazard bag like I do, you can either print off the biohazard symbol online, it's actually available on the BioPrint website, or you can simply write with a Sharpie marker on a piece of paper and put that on top of the bag. But before you do that, so you put your samples in the bag, and then you wrap the bag up with paper towels. And you have to have enough paper towels wrapped around it to absorb all the fluid in the tubes if all the tubes were to break. I've never had one break, but that's the USPS um, regulations on that. So, now you've got your bundled tubes in your bag, paper towels wrapped around them, and then you will pack the rest with either bubble wrap, in my case, or you could actually use more paper towels or newspaper and then put it in a box. I like to send it in as small a box as possible because it saves on shipping. This is a little on the really small side. As you can see, it's not a whole lot bigger than the tips, but everything should fit just fine. And then of course you include payment. In my case, I'll be sending a check. So I'll go ahead and uh, wrap these up. I personally like to print off the shipping address that I don't have to look it up and write it down by hand every time, but you don't have to print it. I just have it saved as a file on my computer. There we go. Put this down. tape it down on all sides just to be sure that it's not going to get ripped off in transit. Now since I am, <clears throat> since the lab is actually in Florida, it's the St. Cloud lab, um, I don't intend to send this priority mail, but if it's going to be in the mail for more than two days you really should send it priority. I'm going to send this first class because it's definitely weighs less than a pound. So I'll just go ahead and send that off with someone to the post office this afternoon and then wait to get the results.